This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Check out Squarespace through the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. Not far outside the historic British city of Salisbury lies one of the most famous landscapes in the world. Wiltshire is where the great painter John Constable did his best work, a pastoral patchwork of fields that is the very essence of England. But while it may look picturesque, this landscape hides a dark secret. Fenced off from the rest of the world, a 30 square kilometer research station sits beside a village. It's guarded by soldiers, the work happening inside its anonymous walls more than top secret. Its name is Porton Down, and it's the United Kingdom's secret nerve gas lab. Established during the chaos of the First World War, Porton Down was at the very center of British chemical and bioweapons research. It was here that mustard gas was tested, that anthrax bombs were produced, and that the deadliest nerve agent known to man was synthesized. It was also here that the government conducted secret trials, exposing unsuspecting volunteers to sarin and then hushing up the tragic results. Shrouded in secrecy, tainted with scandal, this is Porton Down, the most dangerous building in Britain. On the evening of April the 22nd, 1915, the German military changed the course of warfare. The previous couple of days, it's in strange activity along the front lines at Ypres, as German soldiers lined up metal canisters along a four-kilometer stretch of battlefield. Finally, on that fateful day, the signal went out. The Germans opened the canisters. Slowly, a wall of yellow mist began to roll toward the Allied trenches. Whoever it touched felt their throat burning, their eyes stinging, and their lungs failing. Although no one in the trenches that day knew it, they'd just been caught up in the first major gas attack in modern history. The yellow mist was chlorine, and it was deadly. The Ypres attack killed 1,100 Allied soldiers and injured more than 7,000. For the Allies, the discovery of this new German superweapon was a little like getting into a boxing ring with an opponent who need to discover that they have magic fists that can melt flesh. In London, the British government immediately authorized research into poison gas, desperate to catch up with the German war machine. That September 1915, a site was selected. Situated just outside of the historic city of Salisbury near the village of Porton, it was initially known as the Porton Camp Experimental Research Station. Before long, though, it would acquire its more famous name, Porton Down. The establishment of Porton Down didn't come a moment too soon. Just before Christmas that year, the Germans added phosphine gas to their arsenal. Although their initial attempts to deploy it were less successful, it would turn out to be even deadlier than chlorine. The following March 1916, Porton Down officially began operation testing nearly 200 compounds for use as weapons. But while the nature of the experiments was deadly serious, the reality of them sometimes tipped into the ridiculous. In 1916, not many people knew what they were doing with chemical weapons, not even scientists. So Porton Down's experts initially had a habit of making what we'd call absurd mistakes. Mistakes like unleashing a load of poison gas in a field and only realizing afterward that the wind was blowing in the direction of nearby villages. Even when things were intentional, they were still bizarre. In one experiment, scientists wanted to see if a man could outrun arsenic gas. So they hired an amateur sprinter, sprayed a whole lot of arsenic at him, and told him to run. You'll be glad to know that the answer was yes, a sufficiently terrified man can indeed outrun a chemical weapon. In July 1917, the situation in Europe it was getting critical. The Germans had just begun using mustard gas on the battlefield, which was far less deadly than chlorine or phosphine, but which was much, much better at blinding and injuring people. So the Allies they decided to fight fire with fire. In June 1918, British mustard gas was used for the first time against the Central Powers. Over the next few months, thousands of German troops were injured by chemical weapons. Among their number was Adolf Hitler. In October, the future Führer was blinded by mustard gas developed at Porton Down and evacuated to a military hospital. Spoiler alert, unfortunately he recovered. When World War I finally ended that November, chemical weapons had killed nearly 100,000 people and injured over 1.3 million. Although everyone agreed the weapons were immoral, there was no arguing with figures like that, which may be why, in the 1920s, the British government passed a bill to keep Porton Down operational. And, well, 
It was lucky they did so. In just a few short years, scientists were going to make a discovery that would take chemical warfare into an even darker era. In 1936, an obscure German scientist named Gerhard Schrader very nearly caused a catastrophic industrial accident. Schrader was working on a new class of pesticide for IG Farben when he accidentally spilled a couple of drops. In no time at all, Schrader's eyes were watering, his skin was slick with sweat, and he was having trouble breathing. Freakier still, his pupils had contracted until they were just tiny dots, making the brightly lit lab seem as dark as it would at night time. Schrader didn't know it, but it just simultaneously discovered and poisoned himself with history's first nerve agent. As chemicals go, nerve agents are almost uniquely terrifying. Our muscles contract when acetylchlorine is released. Normally they relax again when the enzyme acetylcholinesterinase destroys all that contraction-loving acetylcholine. But nerve agents inactivate the enzyme, sending the body into spasms and causing suffocation. Fittingly for such a creepy chemical, Schrader's colleagues gave it the name taboo after the German word for taboo. You know, as in, all that thing is taboo, let's not make any more of it. Unfortunately, Germany in 1936 was about to be as taboo as possible. When the Nazis found out about the agent, they quickly realized it would make an excellent weapon. As World War II lumbered closer, scientists in Berlin began experimenting with Schrader's findings, trying to make an even more deadly breakthrough. In 1943, they succeeded. If you've never heard of sarin, just know it's the sort of stuff that gives other chemical weapons nightmares, a nerve agent so potent it can kill you gruesomely in a mere 15 minutes. When the Japanese doomsday cult Um Shin Rikyo released a low-grade cloud of it on the Tokyo subway in 1995, they managed to kill 13 people and injure over 6,000. The stuff the Nazis were producing, it was infinitely purer. To use a crude analogy, the stuff Ohm sympathized was the watered-down beer of nerve agents. The stuff the Nazis were producing, well, that was 100% pure methanol. But not that anyone knew about it. Over at Port and Down, British scientists were still producing mustard gas, unaware that the Germans were working on the chemical equivalent of the Manhattan Project. Even when a Nazi scientist was captured in the North Africa campaign in 1943 and told his interrogators about sarin, no one believed him. A special report sent to Porton Down was dismissed simply as Nazi propaganda. It was a dismissal that could have ended in catastrophe. By now, the Nazis had built a factory in Die Hernforth in occupied Poland that was producing thousands of tons of taboo and sarin. At the Battle of Stalingrad that winter, Hitler nearly authorized its use. As generals, they even wanted to drop it over Britain. Yet, for whatever reason, Hitler could never bring himself to use nerve agents. It could be that he remembered all too clearly being gassed himself. It could be that German intelligence had mistakenly reported Porton Down was developing its own nerve agents to use in retaliation. So, Hitler never flicked that particular doomsday switch. But while there was no sarin at Porton Down in 1943, that was about to change. Let's cut ahead now to April 1945. The Third Reich is in ruins, the German countryside in flames. Just as Berlin is on the cusp of falling, a group of British soldiers stumble across a huge stockpile of sarin. Barely two weeks later, Porton Down authorized the first trials of the mysterious Nazi gas. 56 volunteers were exposed to extremely low concentrations. The results were heart-stopping. Like Gerhard Schrader back in 1936, all test subjects became badly sick. The pupils contracted, some lost their sight for as long as five days. As one British official described it, the Allies had been caught with our pants down. Not long after, all other chemical weapons work at Port and Down was downgraded. From now on, the facility's number one priority would be producing sarin. The end of World War II saw the Allies engage in a mad scramble for Nazi tech, often going to hypocritical lengths. Famously, Operation Paperclip spirited hundreds of Nazi rocket scientists to the United States, shielding them from prosecution in exchange for boosting America's military might. What's less well known is that the scientists weren't just involved in rocket design. They were also involved in the development of chemical weapons. Within months of the war's official end, the US, Great Britain, France, and the USSR all had active nerve gas programs. And as each nation refines their own weapons, they got more and more nervous about the other guys having them. Come 1950, the British government was convinced the Soviets were stockpiling nerve gas. Terrified of what sarin might do to a civilian population, they authorized Porton Down to start conducting intense human trials. 
Now, this should have been illegal. Back in 1946, most governments in the world, including Britain, had signed up to the Nuremberg Code, a prohibition on conducting experiments on humans that was created in the wake of Nazi and Japanese medical atrocities. But what was the British government to do? Sit on their backsides and wait for Soviet sarin to be sprayed over London? So the scientists at Porton Down began recruiting enlisted men to test their nerve agents on. Controversially, they didn't tell them what the tests were for. It's a mild experiment to find a cure for the common cold, was the standard refrain when anyone asked. Decades later, inquiries into the illegal experiments at Porton Down would reveal that doctors in the early 1950s felt no need to tell patients the truth. They felt that the nation's common good outweighed the rights of a single individual soldier. After all, they were being careful, weren't they? It's not like anyone was going to die or anything, right? That same year, 1950, 113 volunteers were exposed to higher concentrations of sarin in order to study the effects. Most came down with severe eye pain, headaches, and fits of vomiting. Despite this, tests at even greater doses were authorized. By the end of 1952, thousands of British soldiers had been exposed unwittingly to the nerve agents, some at doses that tiptoed dangerously close to the lethal threshold. In February 1953, that threshold was nearly crossed when one of Porton Down's subjects experienced what was called a serious adverse reaction. Yet, the experiments continued, and the dosage got higher. On April the 27th, scientists at the lab dropped 300 milligrams of sarin onto the uniforms of six men. Among them was John Kelly, another volunteer who didn't know what he was volunteering for. But while most of Porton Down's volunteers merely got sick, Kelly suffered a reaction beyond anything the doctors had yet seen. Not long after being dosed with sarin, Kelly collapsed. He slipped into a coma and nearly died. Although he ultimately recovered, it was the wake-up call the Institute needed. Orders came down from on high. Stop the madness. Stop playing God. From now on, doses of sarin would be capped at a mere 15 milligrams, one twentieth of what Kelly had been exposed to. Unfortunately, this was the 1950s, when the doctor always knew best. Seeing their new orders, the researchers nodded their agreement and then reduced the doses to 200 milligrams. Not long after, a 20-year-old RAF engineer named Ronald Madison was offered 15 shillings to take part in an experiment to find a cure for the common cold. Needing the money to buy an engagement ring for his girlfriend, he accepted. Now, just before we get into what happens to poor Ronald, I do want to take a moment to tell you about Squarespace, whose support makes these long videos possible. Two simple things. Maybe you've got some idea for running a website or a business or a YouTube channel or a podcast, something like that. Just something knocking around in your mind as an idea. And well, the second thing is that the only way to figure out if that is worth doing is to get it out there to the world. And that can be daunting because it's scary to go and try and pursue new things. But not knowing how to set up a web website is not an excuse. No excuses are available when you use Squarespace. Squarespace allows you to create a powerful website for whatever you're up to. Want to sell something online? Yes, easy to set up a store with Squarespace. Want to do a podcast? Start a YouTube channel? Well, you'll want a website to complement that channel, and they absolutely support podcasts. It all starts on Squarespace with a beautiful template that you can customize to your heart's content, or you can start from scratch, move over from an existing domain. It makes everything super easy to manage. Don't start from scratch, though. That's my recommendation. Use a template. Like I say, no excuses. And once you've gone through the super easy customization process, there are no updates, there are no patches, there's no tech BS to deal with. And Squarespace also handle all of that website-y stuff. Like I say, they do podcasts, mailing lists, all of that good stuff. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash geographics to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And let's find out what happens to Ronald and some other unfortunate people. It was 10 a.m. on May the 6th, 1953, when Ronald Madison stepped into the Porton Down gas chamber. He was part of a small group of volunteers that day, all of whom thought they were testing a mild drug. As the men sat in a small circle, their faces hidden behind gas masks, the scientists went around them one by one, dropping 200 milligrams of sarin onto patches of their uniforms. At 10.17, Madison was given a dose on his arm. It's impossible to know what the young man thought as he watched those insignificant drops land on the fabric. Was he thinking of his girlfriend, of the ring that he would soon buy, or was he just thinking about how uncomfortable the chamber was, how he couldn't wait to get out into the sunshine again? 
Well, there's no way we'll ever know. As time ticked away, the small group of volunteers slowly began to feel the effects of the nerve agent. First came the dimming of their vision as their pupils contracted, then came the sheen of sweat lying slick across their bodies. Outside the chamber, the scientists watched, unconcerned. This was a smaller dose than the one that had nearly killed John Kelly. I mean, what did they have to worry about? It turned out the answer was plenty. At nearly quarter to eleven, Madison began to complain that he wasn't feeling good, that he needed to be let out of the chamber. As the scientists opened the door, he removed his gas mask, mumbling that he couldn't hear. He took a few steps towards a nearby bench, and then collapsed on the floor, his body convulsing. Just outside, 19-year-old Alfred Thornhill was one of the ambulance workers on call that day at Porton Down. When the alarm went up, he was first on the scene. What he saw that day scarred him for the rest of his life. In testimony decades later, Thornhill described seeing Madison on the floor convulsing so hard that it looked like he was being electrocuted. Four scientists were trying to hold his body down, but he continued to twitch. A thick white substance was foaming from the boy's mouth, a substance Thornhill would describe as looking like frog spawn. By the time Thornhill and the ambulance crew got Madison to the on-base hospital, the ward had already been evacuated of patients, and now a gaggle of terrified doctors were waiting in white lab coats for the poisoned airmen. As Madison was placed on the bed, Thornhill saw them inject him with a huge syringe. One of the doctors lifted up Madison's bare leg. According to Thornhill, the leg was turning blue. Not all at once, but with the blueness creeping upward from his foot, like a liquid that was slowly engulfing his body. Moments later, a nurse shouted at him to leave, but Thornhill never forgot the sight of that flowing color. Moving, he said, like something from outer space. By the time the clock struck eleven, Madison was dead. He was ash and gray, his pulse undetectable. Although doctors continued to try pumping adrenaline directly into his heart, it was useless. The sarin had done its work, the very thing it had been designed by the Nazis to do. At 13.30, Madison was pronounced dead. In the aftermath, the facility went into full arse-covering mode. Thornhill was made to sign a sheet of paper and told that if he ever breathed a word of this to anyone, he would be thrown in prison for the rest of his life. At the Ministry of Defense, a conspiracy was enacted to record Madison's death as that of a generic accident, with no mention being made of sarin. As for Porton Down itself, the incident finally shook the researchers out of their complacency. The recommendation made after John Kelly's near-fatal accident of using lower concentrations was put into place. But the sarin trials, they still didn't stop. For the rest of the Cold War, until 1989, volunteers were routinely exposed to nerve gas. By the end of the experiments, over 20,000 British servicemen had been poisoned. Even after Madison's death, many of them still weren't told what was happening to them. They all just thought... They were helping to cure the common cold. So far in this video, we focused on Porton Down's history with nerve agents. But it wasn't just chemical research Britain's WMD lab was involved in. Even as German scientists were creating sarin in the Second World War, Porton Down was developing bioweapons to haunt your nightmares. The tests began in earnest in 1940. These were the days of the Battle of Britain when Luftwaffe planes streaked across the skies and invasion seemed imminent. With time possibly running out, the British scrambled for a weapon that could disrupt German society on a huge scale. To cause such big problems, they turned to something very small. Microbes. That year, Porton Down worked to create weaponized versions of typhoid, cholera, and botulinum that could be used to spread panic in a population. They also experimented with diseases such as foot and mouth that could destroy German livestock. But the weapon they had most success with was one that could be used against humans or animals with a huge mortality rate. Anthrax production started in earnest in Porton Down in November of 1941. If you've never heard of anthrax, just be aware that it's one of the nastiest diseases in existence. The mortality rate when inhaled is over 80%. With a relatively small amount of the stuff, you could wipe out an entire city. Not that the British were intending to do this. Well, not exactly. Anthrax bombs were authorized only for use in the event that the Nazis deployed a banned weapon against Britain first. Perhaps Hitler was more right than he realized when he demurred from attacking London with sarin. Still, there was no doubting the lethality of the stuff that was cooked up in Port and Down. In 1942, scientists decided to test the bioweapon on the islands of Grenard off the coast of Scotland. A flock of sheep was tied up and a single anthrax bomb was dropped. Within three days, all the sheep were dead. 
But the bomb was even more effective than just as a killing machine. Grenard was rendered so contaminated that no one was allowed to set foot there for over 40 years, and even then, only after all of the topsoil had been removed and the ground sterilized by formaldehyde. Were anthrax dropped on a German city, it would become uninhabitable for generations. Thankfully, that never happened. Just as the Nazis resisted using sarin against the Allies, so the Allies couldn't bring themselves to deploy bioweapons against the Axis. When World War II finally ended, the majority of Port and Downs anthrax was destroyed. Yet bioweapons research didn't stop, it just got morally murkier. Let's jump forward to the 1950s. Port and Downs sarin trials are underway, and the Cold War looms large in government planning. In response to reports of Soviet bioweapons, the UK decided to authorize secret experiments to assess Britain's vulnerability to germ warfare. Starting in 1955, British planes began flying the length of the country, ostensibly to monitor the weather, but in reality to clandestinely dump zinc cadmium sulfide over civilian areas. The following year, 1956, bacteria were secretly released on the London Underground to see how far a bioweapons attack on the tube might spread. And in 1961, ships off the southern coast started spraying holiday resorts with bacteria designed to mimic anthrax. The British government insisted all of these trials were perfectly safe. But there's perfectly safe, and then there's perfectly safe, but also totally creepy, and spraying anything that mimics anthrax over unsuspecting civilians definitely falls into the latter category. Yet even this top-level secrecy it couldn't last forever. Before the 20th century was out, wheels would be put into motion that would eventually expose all of Port and Down's dirty secrets to the entire world. Although Port and Down gave up producing chemical and bioweapons in the 1950s, that didn't stop the lab from creating some pretty freaky stuff. In the 1950s, for example, scientists there were responsible for creating VX, to date the deadliest nerve agent in existence. Remember how 15 milligrams was set as a safe dose for sarin, well below the threshold for death? Well, just 10 milligrams of VX is enough to kill a person, and this isn't just theoretical knowledge. In the 1990s, Um Shinriko, those Japanese guys again, they used VX to murder a dissident. Nearly 20 years later, in 2017, North Korea used it to assassinate Kim Jong-un's half-brother in an international airport. Nerve agents aside, Porton Down keeps active cultures of Ebola, smallpox, and the plague, all of which they test on animals. We actually found a report in the Telegraph that described how Porton Down pigs were shot, rabbits blown up, and guinea pigs injected with a toxic nerve agent invented by the Nazis. It's quite the sentence there. But how the heck do we know all of this? How do we know what Port and Down is? For a large part of our knowledge, you can thank Gordon Bell, a former serviceman. Bell was one of the soldiers who volunteered for the lab's sarin experiments, thinking he was doing something harmless. In the late 1990s, he began complaining about the treatment he had received until there was so much media interest that the local police launched an investigation. And just like that, the lid of secrecy was blown clean off. Over the next few years, details leaked out over Port and Down's experimental history of the incredible, terrifying things that had happened there. It was during the investigation that the truth of Ronald Madison's death came out, that the true number of all those who had sarin tested on them came to light. By the time the final appeals wrapped in 2008, the Ministry of Defense had been forced to admit gross negligence and to award 361 Port and Down survivors a payout of three million pounds. Today, Port and Down's name, it still carries a frisson of controversy in Britain, a feeling that dark things were done there that maybe should have never been contemplated. And yet, we'd be lying if we tried to paint Port and Down as another Arask 7. Despite Madison's death, Despite the unethical nature of the sarin trials, Britain's secret WMD lab has never reached the levels of negligence and arse covering that was seen in the USSR. In 2018, all those years experimenting with nerve agents came in useful when a suspected Russian attack in Salisbury using Novichok poisoned 14 people and left one dead. In the aftermath, it was Porton Down scientists who were able to advise on how to treat the victims. In the end, then, Port and Down is perhaps best seen as a necessary evil, a place that not so long ago indulged in some truly awful behavior, but which now has learned its lesson. At least, we hope that's the case. Because like it or not, Port and Down is still home to all these substances. Anthrax, VX gas, weaponized Ebola, and of course, sarin. They all still sit on its shelves alongside vials of smallpox and the plague. Tiny little things, all capable of causing gigantic disasters. 
Not so long ago, in 2007, a faulty pipe at a facility for animal disease research caused an outbreak of foot and mouth disease in Surrey, just 80 kilometers from Porton Down. While that was quickly contained, it still caused a small scale disaster. Now just imagine if that had been something else, something that infected humans. Something like the nightmares that were created at Porton Down. Porton Down may be the sort of facility that it's necessary for a modern state to have, but it's also a monument to our species' darkest dreams, a reminder of all the times we've already tried to wipe one another out and all the times that are still to come. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that like button below and don't forget to subscribe. We got brand new videos currently twice per week. So hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell. Also, why not check out our sister channel, Biographics? This channel is about places. That channel is about people. Find it linked to below. And as always, thank you for watching.